Welcome everyone back to a very special broadcast. I'm David Woods. He's Tracy Pearson. We're from Bruinport Online, but we're not the exciting ones today. Athletic Director Martin Jarman joining us. Martin, thanks for coming on. David, Tracy, good to be with you. I don't know about the exciting part. I think you guys are probably more exciting than, than me, man. <laughs> well, well, it's not, it's not, it's not every day we get the uh, sitting UCLA AD on the podcast, so it's great to have you. And, and you get the award easily for the best background, Martin. Is that real oh. or is that one of those fake? Oh, oh look it's at the chair. Too, man. Come on, coach. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I, did I you get the that. man in the? Did the man in the arena get mounted after your arrival, or was that already there? Yeah, I, I had I had the man in the arena behind my desk when I was at Boston College. I've always had that, and uh, it's just a. I love the poem. I love everything that it represents because uh, not many people sit in your chair or walk in your shoes, and it's, and it's a good reminder that. You know, there's a lot that comes with that, and uh, you just got to be able to block the noise sometimes, as you guys <laughs> probably know. <laughs> noise? No, we don't know anything about that. Speaking of that noise, uh, this I don't know that I can imagine a three years of uh, a tenure that's more hectic and crazy with external <laughs> events, internal events, so many crazy things going on. The most recent one, obviously, the reverberations throughout the world of college sports with all the realignment stuff. What was your reaction to... I mean, potentially dissolution of the Pac-12, everyone breaking apart, but specifically Oregon and Washington uh, joining UCLA and USC in the Big Ten next year. Yeah, well, realignment has been a part of our world, you know, the last two years, and it'll probably remain that way uh, moving forward. You know, I think um, anything that you see realignment wise, it's always something that at, initially there's a shock, but then you kind of settle in and you just got to be ready. You got to be nimble and flexible. And that's what we've been this whole time. You know, obviously we've been working with things on the big 10 level and now with Washington and Oregon, uh, you know, personally, I, I like that. I think it's good to have both of those schools in the big 10. Uh, I think from a competitive standpoint, they're strong. It allows us another West coast trip. So that takes away one uh, East coast trip. Uh, we're working with the big 10 now with scheduling and different things, but I think it's a positive, you know, um, you, you never, you know, personally, I didn't like to see kind of how everything went down these last two weeks. You know, that's tough because I have colleagues that people I care about that this impact impacts them in a significant way. Um, but, you know, my focus is always doing what's best for UCLA. And, and I'm glad that we're in the position that we're in. Looking at because there was a schedule released for football uh, prior to, obviously, Oregon and Washington joining in. Is your anticipation that there will be I, I don't even know what the word is going to be for it, but some version of a protected schedule with Oregon and Washington being included, or is that putting the cart before the horse right now? I think the model will be consistent from a, from a standpoint of some kind of protection, whether that's the flex one that we currently have, or whether that changes to a flex two or depending on who you are, I think the structure will stay the same. I think some of the principles will stay the same. Uh, we're actually going to have a call with the ADs, the first one with Washington and Oregon, uh, next week to talk about some of the scheduling parameters and uh, make sure everybody understands the principles. So um, I don't think you'll see the structure change as much, um, but I do think you, you, you know, you'll probably see obviously some of the team and pairings change based on whatever the computer model comes out with, but um, it's exciting. You know, it's going to be great matchups and that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. When it comes to uh, the, the kind of money boost you're going to get from the media deal. Uh, it's been said about $70 million on average uh, over the course of seven years. Um, what can that do for the UCLA athletic department, specifically also for the UCLA football program? You know, we want to be elite. We want to be great. We want to compete at the highest level at all times in all sports. And so to do that, you have to have resources. Um, I don't know about that 70 number. That seems a little high, but um, but what I do know is it's going to be more resources than we've been getting uh, in our current situation. And, and that's going to help us directly impact our student athletes in a positive way. You talk about nutrition, you talk about travel, you talk about academic support. Uh, you talk about just everything that impacts that student athlete experience, mental health. You know, there are things that we have not been able to do for our athletic program and for our student athletes, quite frankly, that we should be doing. And now we're going to have the ability to do some of that. You know, next year, we're going to feed um, all of our teams uh, a meal for the first time, all of our Olympic sports. We haven't been able to do that because that, co that costs a couple million dollars. You know, right. now we're going to be able to do that. So we're going to improve our nutrition just like that. So this is about the resources that we need, our student athletes need to compete 
and perform at the highest level and be the best version of themselves. So what I think you're going to see is you're going to see more investment in our student athletes and our programs. Um, that's going to happen. And, and that's what I'm excited about. When, when looking at that move to the Big Ten, just from a competition on the field standpoint, you know, I think everyone's trying to wrap their heads around it a year ago. Now with the Oregon and Washington additions, it becomes, I think, a little bit now more it makes acute. more sense what we did, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly true, but also it makes it a little bit more acute. Like, those are two really good programs in addition to what was already in the Big Ten. And I'm speaking specifically about football. Um, but looking at that competitive landscape, now UCLA has a seat at the table. But what's the – how do you put into place a plan for – succeeding at that level to, to succeed in the, in this new world order, new conference. Yeah. You know, the big 10 has big brands, um, great competition, uh, big name schools, but UCLA is a big brand. We're a big name school. We compete at the highest level. You, you, Dave, you mentioned football. Football has a winning record against big 10 opponents with nearly 50 wins. Men's basketball, I think over the last six or seven years is like, um, or overall 80 and, and 41 against Big Ten schools. And we've beaten a couple of them the last few years. Michigan and Michigan State on the Final Four run. We, we beat Maryland at Maryland. Um, and we beat Northwestern in the tournament. So, you know, football and basketball, if that's what you're speaking of specifically, we've been playing Big Ten teams. We've been winning. And the expectation for all of our teams, is we want to get to the Big Ten day one and compete and win. You know, so that's that's important. We don't we don't focus on others. We focus on ourselves. We got to make sure we're doing everything we can to be the best version of UCLA when we get to the Big Ten, August 2nd, 2024. Not that I'm counting. <laughs> no. Wow. Yeah, I thought you might have a little counter behind you going on. No. I'm focused, man. We're focused. Okay. You know, we, we, we want to – I mean, this is, a, this is an interesting time in our business and in college athletics, but we have a window at UCLA to really, you know, hit that thing and, and make sure that we compete and put our student athletes in a position to – to continue to excellence and, and improve and move forward. When you're, when you're judging and grading success, I'm sure internally you have your own benchmarks you want to hit and all the different sports and all those different things. How, how has the process started to adjust for you for when it's going to be a new conference situation with a different competitive landscape in terms of how you're going to grade your programs and grade your coaches and all that, that sort of environment? Yes and no. So it, how I look at our program is consistent from day one, the first day I got here. I look at our student athlete experience. Are we improving that? What is that experience? Are they having competitive championship seasons? Are they getting better? Are they becoming better human beings? So when they leave Westwood, that's the ultimate measure of success, in my opinion, is directly impacting the student athlete experience and, and how they do, right? So that doesn't change whatever conference you're in. Now, that said, you know, when you change a conference, you've got to look at the landscape. We've been evaluating what other schools have, the resources they have, what do they invest in, and then looking at UCLA. We're not going to look like Wisconsin. We're not going to look like Penn State. But there's some things that Westwood and UCLA have that those schools don't have. So how do we lean more into that? We've got a great alumni network. I'm thinking about how do we tap into our alumni more in a, in a bigger and better way, not only to help um, – our, our student athletes with work experiences, but also NIL and, and, and those kind of things. That's really important, right? So, so I look at how we measure the student athlete experience. And then also we have a scoreboard. Let's be frank. We have a scoreboard. We want to win. We compete. Uh, we want to maintain our academic excellence. That's something that's always been a part of UCLA. We're going to always do it the right way. And then we got a scoreboard. We want to win. And so we got to invest in that and help our coaches, our student athletes have success in that manner. So when you're talking about winning – um, a lot of our fans would say it comes down to recruiting, um, the talent, uh, the Jimmy's and Joe's over the X's and O's. Um, there's two things, talent, recruiting talent and developing talent. Those are the two main things right there. Let's start with the first one. Um, being in the big 10 footprint, how can UCLA use this to upgrade its talent, to be able to be competitive from a talent standpoint? with the big 10, what do you think the recruiting efforts of the football team, what do they have to do? What, what extra do they have to do? What extra mile do they have to go in the big 10? So I'm not a coach and we got, we've got 25 programs. So every coach has their own method of recruiting, right? Um, you know, for some, I, I think you're not going to see the base of our recruiting change across the board. I think, you know, Southern California, California, West coast, I think that will, will remain consistent. 
But then in every sport, you got to look at what are the what are the pluses and minuses? You know, one thing for us going to the Big Ten, and it's a conference in the Midwest and East Coast, we got better weather than any of those schools. So now that's a value proposition. If you're a, a student athlete or recruit in the Midwest or East Coast or, or South, not only you could come to L.A. and have great weather, but you could be at the best number one public institution in the country, uh, second most national championships, highly athletic, competitive um, school, and then live in Westwood. Which, which is something is a lot harder to do if you're not in college. And one of the things that I talk about is you get to come and be a student athlete three, four, five years and live in L.A. Uh, and still compete against the best schools in the country across the country. Who's got it better than that? So I think we got to lean into some of those natural recruiting positives that we have. And I think it's going to open up conversations with other recruits in areas that maybe we haven't recruited as much. You know, I know I, I talked to our women's soccer coach, Marg, and I know that we have, you know, a, a student athlete from Texas now that a year, year and a half ago, maybe we weren't in that conversation with. And now we are because we're a part of a, a national brand conference and playing some of the best in the country. Uh, that's that's something that we got to lean into. I think you're going to pick some things here and there. Um, obviously, in football, we've gotten some recruits from the Midwest, um, a lot of prominent, successful uh, high school careers recruits. I don't know exactly what I can say, so I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be careful. You can talk about Dante more. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, Dante's here. I can say Dante. Yeah, there you there go. go. There's other recruits that we've gotten that we've signed or, or verbal that are from Midwestern states, and I think that's really important because that just that opens it up even more for us. You know, everybody talks about uh, everybody coming to Southern Cal California to recruit. Well, we're going other places to recruit too. UCLA's coming now, and and maybe. It wasn't the same when we were at West Coast and we have 730 kicks and you don't see us on the East Coast and Midwest. You see us now. So I think it's, it's exciting when I think about the recruiting and what this move means for that. One other question, just one more question about um, realignment. Uh, what's your opinion of Cal and Stanford potentially joining the Big Ten? I have no opinion on, on Cal or Stanford. I, I, I don't control that. It's crazy out there. Um, I love Cal and I love Stanford. I, I, I hope that whether it stays in the Pac-4, 12, whatever, um, I just hope that they land in a good spot. And, and uh, that's important to me. I know I'm, I'm very helpful when I can to both Cal and Stanford. Um, I think those are two great brands, great schools. Uh, we have a history of competing against both of them. We want to compete against both. Uh, I've let both of them know that, that all of our sports would love to compete. Uh, still with them and you know they got to sort out kind of where they're going to land and what they're going to be before we can kind of move forward with that but um, I want I want a, a great outcome for both Stanford and Cal. Uh, flipping back a little bit to recruiting because the elephant in the room when you're talking about recruiting in basketball and football is NIL it's what recruits are mm -hmm. asking about a ton throughout the process and I, I, I've got two avenues I want to take with that and the first one is how temporary of a situation do you think this is? Cause there's a lot of talk that this might sure. not be the model going forward. And mm -hmm. what's your sense of that as somebody who's kind of on the forefront of a lot of this stuff, like what's your sense of the conversations going on about what is the compensation model going to be for players at some point in the future? Um, I'm going to answer that two ways. First. Sure. The, the first one is ever since I got here in 2020, I've, I've come into UCLA when it's chaos and chaotic, starting at the beginning of the pandemic, right? So one thing that I've learned is you've got to be nimble and flexible and open to what the future is going to look like. You cannot be married or wedded to the past. You've got to respect it. You've got to learn from it. But you've got to, you've got to move forward and navigate and lead in a way because everything is changing um, and nothing is consistent, right? So when you operate from a, from a leadership point in chaos, You've got to be consistent, focused, nimble, flexible. So I don't know what the future holds. I, I don't think NIL is going away. I think NIL is positive. I think our student athletes being able to benefit in this way, learning about their brand, learning about um, requirements, time commitments, um, you know, what's good choices, bad choices when it comes to who they associate themselves with, with brands. That's all good. We should be doing that while they're on campus. They should be learning those lessons while they're here instead of when they become a professional. So I think NIL, I've always been a proponent of NIL. Uh, and I think it's in a good place. I think, I think you hear about the two, three, four percent that's that's negative, but I think it's 90 plus percent that's positive for, for all of our student athletes, right? So that said, I don't see the toothpaste going back in the tube. I, I, <laughs> the collectives and NIL is here to stay. 
Uh, I don't see that changing. Obviously, if it does, we'll adjust when it comes. But, you know, we've been focused on, you know, when something new like this, how do we ramp up to help our student athletes? You know, we've got Westwood Exchange. That's important, allowing both donors, fans and student athletes to come to the marketplace. And now we've got collectives. I think NIL for us was bumpy at first. Right. It's new. You're trying to navigate and learn. Um, one thing I can tell everybody is UCLA is going to do it the right way. You know, we're not we're not going to support a pay for play system. Um, you're going to get NIL benefit, uh, but doing the work and, and how it's structured and supposed to be. And the beauty of, of our collectives who are doing great work, um, some of them men of Westwood, a champion of Westwood. Uh, some of them are, are doing great work with working with our compliance to make sure that student athletes uh, deals are, 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 are recognized and documented to make sure we keep their eligibility intact. Um, there's great communication and, and they all know we're not going to do things, but one way, and that's the right way. Um, and, and I think NIL is important. I think, you know, from a, from a fundraising standpoint, wouldn't athletic fund is critical. Um, NIL is critical in a perfect world. You give to both. Not everybody's going to, right. And that's, that's okay. But if it's a dollar, whether it's NIL or wouldn't athletic fund to our student athletes to help them, that's a positive for UCLA. That's the way I look at it. That's the way our team looks at it. So um, NIL is here. It's important because it's important to our student athletes and it helps them. So, so we recognize that. And that's why we work so hard at it and learning and educating and doing different things that we can. And I, and I got to say this too, just so everybody knows sure. rules. We cannot an athletic department go out and broker deals for student athletes. Right. That is, that is against the rules. We can't do that. We can provide education. We can talk to fans, donors, alumni about the importance of NIL, which we do. Um, but at the end of the day, Dave, if it's your money, you're going to decide what you want to do with it. I can't, mm -hmm. Martin Jarman can't make you do this or do that. What I can do is, is, is educate you, tell you how important it is to our student athletes and, and you make those decisions. But, but the way I look at it is a dollar coming to UCLA to benefit our student athletes this way or that way is all good way. So many questions here about NIL, which you probably talk for about two hours over this, but um, <laughs> like you said, it's a new thing. You're, you're kind of working through it, as is every athletic department. Uh, has there been a little bit of a conflict with UCLA donors trying to understand who they should donate to, whether it's a Wooden Athletic Fund or the NIL collectives? Has that been an issue? Is it something that you think is in a good place? It needs to be kind of streamlined a little bit better. Where would, uh, how, What's the state of that right now? So you'd have to ask donors. Um, I, I can tell you the ones that I've talked to in my experience, this has been new. You got to remember this NIL hasn't been around for 10 years to where there's a general understanding um, of, of everything that's going on or what this impacts or how, how this is. I think it's been an educational process probably over the last year. A lot of donors haven't really understood exactly what NIL is or, or how their dollars would be utilized or, or wouldn't athletic fund. I think there's more clarity now um, and I think my message is NIL and Wooden Athletic Fund are both important. You know, they're both important because they both benefit our student athletes. I think there's a learning curve you're going to have, right? You're going to have some people that say, hey, I'm not comfortable with, with this. I've had that, right? I've talked to, to fans and alumni that say, hey, I'm not comfortable with this. And I say, that's okay, you know. But the more we can educate, the more you see some of the collectors doing really good work with our student athletes, I think you start to learn the benefits and see how it impacts the success of our program and our student athletes. So, you know, you just got to remember, this isn't like it's been 10 years in the making. This is this is two years. Uh, so there's been a curve. And I would say it was probably bumpy for us initially. But I think in the last few months, we've made quite a bit of progress. It seems like there's, um, because it is new, feeling your way uh, as you go. There are some things that can kind of fall through the cracks. Let's say uh, hypothetically, there's a player who has an NIL deal. Like you said, UCLA is not going to be a pay for play uh, athletics department to get that player, let's say, to fulfill his NIL obligations. Uh, so many other little things that could fall through. Um, the Duke basketball program has essentially uh, they've hired a general manager to oversee NIL. Um, would you ever consider doing that just to, just to stay on top of some of the things that could be falling through the cracks? 
if it's something that's going to help our student athletes and our coaches at NIL, we would consider it as long as we can do that. So um, NIL, you know, I've thought about, we've talked about actually hiring additional staff person just to focus on NIL with some of the connections in the, in the community, some of the charitable work that, that is asked of our student athletes and, and what that means. So we thought about that. Um, but, it, but bottom line, Tracy, if there's something that's going to help us in NIL and help our student athletes, we'll consider it. You know, again, this is a new thing that's very important. I understand the importance of NIL. We understand that. And so it's how do we best position our student athletes and our program to where we can have sustained success in this model the way that it is. One more, one more NIL question. Um, <laughs> man, you guys going I, I've got so head. many, man. <laughs> it's big. You know it's big. <laughs> Uh, I think it's important. I've got, I got about seven questions. Let's just do this one. Um, the Ohio State Athletic Department, um, they, I've seen that they have practically like a shopping cart for what donors can pick to get this benefit to pay for their NIL. Michigan um, just officially sponsored an NIL collective. I know UCLA is, is being very careful about the whole thing, and you know we all appreciate that. Um, do you think that th there's a possibility that there will be a chance where there will be donors that can literally go off of maybe almost a shopping cart? They can show up to a practice to donate this for NIL. Is that a possibility? Those kind of things. Like Ohio State's kind of doing that right now. So I'm not familiar with what, what other schools. I haven't heard that. Um, mm -hmm. But I can tell you if it's something that's going to help our NIL efforts and our student athletes, we'll consider it. Um, as long as it's by the book and it's by the rules, you know, that's the most important thing. Again, this is an evolving space. Um, I think I saw last week, Texas A&M had a 12th man foundation plus Not that so was all the rage a year ago. And now they, they stopped it right. Because of some kind of IRS memo that came out. So again, I, I use that as an example to say, this is an evolving landscape. You know, the only thing that I'm going to make sure that we do and what we can do, because again, there's some things that we can't with NIL is, we're going to be aggressive with looking at how we can help our student athletes in this space. And, and if that means hiring personnel for NIL, if that means um, adjusting things and working more closely with some of the groups, so be it, you know, but that's something that, that is really important. Uh, I've got a couple more for you. I know, know you've got a, a time crunch a little bit, but um, I want to, I want to, NIL question though. <laughs> I want to ask a question that's not about basketball or football or NIL. Uh, it is about realignment though. Um, <laughs> So uh, thinking about it with, with the – well, at least the dissolving of the traditional Pac-12 with a lot of these West Coast schools now in different conferences, has there been any discussion, even a preliminary thought, about potentially putting uh, some of the non-revenue sports altogether in some sort of – like something like the MPSF for the, the schools that are still on the West Coast but are now playing in conferences that are further afield for a lot of these sports that – don't generate revenue and, and we'll have a lot of time crunch, especially like baseball playing three games across the country, that sort of thing. You know, our plan is, is obviously PAC 12 this year and everything has been planning with all of our sports going to the big 10. That's, that's what we're focused on. And then MPSF, obviously for our water polo teams and men's volleyball. Um, I think you're going to hear more of that stuff. I mean, that's just, you know, people have conversations all the time. Right. Uh, so I think you'll hear some of that, but, um, the only thing that we're focused on is really the transition to the Big Ten. So right, you um, have to you learn you anything to in this space. Is you got to be nimble, you got to be flexible, and as things come and change and evolve, we're going to be right there at the forefront of it. Let's talk a little bit. Just touch on um, the basketball program, um, specifically the recruiting class that's coming in for 2023. I I've been doing this a long time. I anointed this class literally as one of the best classes in the history of UCLA basketball. Um, Tracy, don't go putting on expectations to these young men, man. Come that's on. What we, that's what we do, Martin. Come on. That's what we do. We do the other thing too. Wow. We, we lower expectations. We do it all. Um, I, sitting back and watching this, how Mick Cronin crafted this class where I'm just curious, were you like on the edge of your seat watching this happen? Like, like all the rest of us. I mean, this was, Usually recruiting uh, basketball ends in November. I mean, he's had to finish off this class in August. Um, it took a gargantuan effort and, a, like I said, a lot of crafting. I mean, it was almost art. 
to be able to work this through getting, getting some of these international guys through UCLA admission, getting them uh, free of their club teams. I mean, it was a big thing. Um, I, just your impression of that whole recruiting class and that effort. Yeah, no, it's, it's obviously a credit to, to Mick and the job that he done, he's done this year. Um, but you know, I, I will say no one probably knows how hard he works. Um, he works at it. I think he's one of the best coaches in the country. Um, I've seen firsthand this past year with the recruiting because he's bringing in such a big class. You know, we've he and I have connected a lot about just what his strategy was. And and then also, you know, when you're talking about international student athletes, there's there's a process, there's admissions, there's acclimation. How do we make them comfortable if we get them here to Westwood? So there's a lot of behind the scenes work that's done to be able to to have a class like this. But it starts with Mick and his staff. They've done a tremendous job uh, of, of recruiting and and having to change and shift based on all the different factors that are going on in college athletics. Um, you know, he, he does a phenomenal job, but he would be the first to tell you, too. It's, it's a team of people. Right. It's it's our, our faculty athletic rep. It's our um, liaisons that work with admissions to help present cases to help the, the people understand our young men that are that are coming that want to come to Westwood and the gifts and talents they have and how they will thrive and how we'll support them when they come to campus. It's all of that, right? It's all a process. Uh, and it's it's just for me, since I've been here, it's, it's been great to see the progress that we have made um, and we are continuing to make with all of our sports when it comes to recruitment of student athletes. But Make no mistake, Mick, Mick did a, a heck of a job this year. Uh, he worked so hard at it. Um, there's no coach in the country that's going to outwork Mick Cronin. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that I had a front row seat and, and uh, could watch him do his thing. And, and I'm excited about his team. Obviously, I'm going, they're going to Spain. I'm going to actually go with the team and, and, and meet some of the guys and, and kind of get to know them. Um, but from the ones I've met so far that are here, incredible young men. You speak French? You speak, you speak Slovenian? No, I was I was I was wanting to say something to Jan. I met Jan the other day, and, and I was like, "Man, I don't I don't know. You know, I, I got to work on it, man." I told Mick, "Man, we gotta we gotta we gotta start learning a little more and expanding our international, uh, our international language abilities." So uh, it's it's good though. It's you know they're they're great young men from what I've met them, and and I'm looking forward to spending more time with them. And then um, I've just got a little bit of uh, catnip for the masses closing out for me. Um, there was a, a schedule released yesterday, a little <laughs> promo schedule with some promotional dates for football. Uh, one of which was tucked away in there was uh, turn back the clock night. And I'm just going to ask for uh, the teaming masses. Uh, will that include a turn back the clock for the uniforms of the UCLA football team? I think you got to wait till turn back the clock week to find that out, Dave, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think you got to wait. There's, what good is it if there's no anticipation, right? Is there a possibility, though, Martin? That's all we want. Just, just the hope. Tracy, <laughs> you got to wait. Is you got to wait. Is, is there a possibility? Uh, you know, I don't know. We, I think we got to see and we got to wait. We got a lot of promotional things that that we're doing this season, and and we also have a big one. I'm excited about pregame. Uh, for games that you'll hear about soon, that we're going to do some things pregame to to bring more people out to the Rose Bowl that I think will be really cool. So, Martin, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Um, what's your reaction to your name being mentioned in connection with other athletic director jobs? You see this all the time. Uh, anytime there's success with a program, you see coaches, you see ADs mentioned, um, I think it's a credit to UCLA and the trajectory we're on and, and my teammates and, and everybody that's a part of this, right? We've been successful and we're, we're continuing on this path. So um, I, don't, I don't respond to every rumor because I, I'd be wasting too much time doing that. Uh, by the way, don't believe everything you read or you hear, especially you two. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that, that I've, I haven't interviewed anywhere. I'm, I'm happy here. I love being a Bruin. I love the work that we're doing and the people I do it with. I think this is a special time in our athletics program. I think UCLA is a special place. And so I'm excited about this season, this last one in the Pac-12. Looking forward to getting into Big Ten and the future. But make no mistake, we got a special thing going in Westwood, and I'm, a, I'm happy to be a part of that. And we're going to keep pushing and keep moving forward. All right. Well, thank you, Martin Jarman. Uh, great to have you on. Uh, great to talk to you. And hopefully we can do this again uh, sometime soon.
Thanks, man. Right. It was great. We'll do it the week of that turn back week. You know what I'm saying? We'll do it then. We'll, we'll talk then. Let's do we'll it. We'll talk then. All right. All right. Thanks, appreciate man. you guys. Thanks so much. All right. We'll see you later. See ya.